So uh, the next feature I want to announce here, it, we've been selling this for a while, is called autopathing. I'll explain what that means. Um, so basically, um, you know, if you, if you recall my architecture slide where I showed the controller VM, you notice that there is one controller VM in a, in a given node. So you might want to ask me, well, what, what happens if the controller VM itself for some reason dies? Well, autopathing is the way through which we keep the whole system available even when the control VM has died. You don't have to move your guest VMs to a different node to make them available. They can continue operating. And how do we do that? Well, there we have a smart agent that runs along with the hypervisor. So it sits with ESX, and it monitors the, the control VM. Anytime the control VM goes down, the smart agent modifies the routing rules in the virtual switch. And that transparently starts sending requests meant for the local controller VM to a remote controller VM. ESX doesn't even blink. It so doesn't even realize that this has happened. So multiple controller VMs share a virtual MAC address? No, they don't share a MAC address. They, uh, we, I, I'll, this will become clearer through my next slide. Uh, but let me go through with this slide. So it transparently routes traffic to a remote controller VM. And the hypervisor just continues to communicate with the same data store address. In the case of NFS, we have an IP address. ESX doesn't know the difference. It continues to send requests to that IP address, and they just happen to reach a remote controller VM. Because of the yeah. reroute. And if the smart agent discovers that the local uh, controller VM has come back online, it will again reroute stuff and make it go back to the local controller VM. So I want to contrast that with multipathing. I mean, multipathing is a term that we've heard in the context of, let's say, iSCSI, where you have multiple addresses that are known to ESX. And if one goes down, then you can go to the other one. In this case, for NFS, there is only one address. And we transparently make sure that that is always alive. And that's why we call it autopathy. So let me demonstrate that with some of these pictures. So I have, uh, this is a server. And this is another server. Uh, the guest VMs are shown in black. And the guest VMs write to their SCSI disks, which is a virtualized device. When they write, the SCSI request, the SCSI I/O request, comes to ESX, which is drawn in this brown box. Inside the ESX, I show a virtual switch and our smart agent that's running there. And then our controller VM also sits on that node and is managed by ESX. Now what I show here is uh, you know, each of the controller VMs exports the data store IP address, which is actually internal to that node. And this now starts answering some of your questions. That address, in this case, I've taken a sample, 192.168.5.2. The other guy sh exports exactly the same IP address. That's why ESX doesn't know the difference. The interesting thing is that data, this, is a, this is an address that's internal to this node. Traffic meant for this address never leaves the node. It's GSLB, but in a data center. Yeah. Now let's see what happens if this controller VM were to fail. So basically, right now, as long as this controller VM is alive, the access pattern is data comes to ESX, and this is a SCSI request. ESX would route it, convert it to uh, NFS or an iSCSI request, and send it through the vSwitch to this controller VM. Right? Now what if this controller VM is down? This agent is going to modify the routing rules in, in the vSwitch. It's going to say that, hey, in order to reach this guy, you need to make an extra hop. Go talk to the external IP address of this guy. So each of the controller VMs has an external IP address through which they communicate. That's not drawn here. So through that routing rule, anytime ESX sends a packet meant for this address, it actually gets sent to this guy. And that's demonstrated by this slide. So now the data access pattern looks like this. You send a request here. The, the guest VM sends a request to ESX. ESX routes that request to the vSwitch. The vSwitch transparently sends it to the controller VM that's sitting remotely. The data comes back. ESX doesn't find out what, what happened. The guest VM doesn't find out what happened. When this guy an comes, arp, so. sorry? There's what? an extra ARP in there somewhere. There is an extra hop in there. Extra yeah, I'm hiding the networking details here. Talking about ARP. So I think the ARP was resolved maybe even hours ago when the systems actually started talking. Yeah, I mean, you have to, so the, there's continuous traffic going on anyway between these two guys. Yeah, no, the, yeah. There, there is, but it's a one-time thing, right? It, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. That, that extra ARP right, right. doesn't matter. Absolutely. So 
and, and once this is done, you know, the, the whole system is available. Now, the interesting thing is this controller VM is down. It could be doing maintenance. It could be doing software upgrades. And yet, this whole system is still available, still alive. That's our autopathing feature. And those are standard V switches? Those aren't standard V switches. <laughs> yeah, nothing custom. The only thing custom here is our agent running there. Okay. Now, the, also, the choice of where to route is also done dynamically. It's not statically tied into each node that here is my brother node that I need to send it to. That's an excellent point. So you have multiple nodes in the cluster. Maybe one node is down. Okay, there's, there's clearly some pieces missing from this diagram. Uh, yeah, I mean, it will become too complicated it's if too we complicated. Give it. <laughs> well, But no, we could talk about it. We use Paxos as a distributed consensus algorithm to find out who to send this request right, no, but, but to. There, there, is, there is dynamism there's, here. There's no physical connection between those two V-switches in that diagram. Yes, yes. So, you know. You've got a logical connection traveling across a lack of physical connection, so there's clearly. Yeah. So, so the smart the smart agent is also smart enough to realize what's happening. done up last in the night. Okay. <laughs> 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 this slide has not been there for a long time. Ideally, it should have gone to a physical link to a physical switch to. And then it gets to too complicated. Yeah, it's, it's simple. So I want to keep it simple. So you well, cannot copy and paste this into your blog. Yes, that's no, correct. So, you know, so that you know, I'm assuming that 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 you know, there's. An Ethernet backplane linking all the nodes in the cluster yes. together. Yes, 10 all the gigabit, time. yes, yes. And, and, and so what you're really doing here is, is dynamically enabling the connection between the vSwitches that the NFS servers are on. Right. To, for, that, for that IP address. To traverse that. So there's another uplink coming out of each vSwitch onto that backplane? From a separate vSwitch. There's a separate vSwitch as well. This is an right. internal vSwitch. There are, there are, so I don't so want to go into the networking two details. Two. There are actually two vSwitches, and we we do some stuff there, but I want to abstract it out, just give the big picture of how, what, what's happening behind the scenes. But we do stuff with networking, and this is, this is getting into software-defined networking. So this is aspects of software-defined networking here uh, coming into play. So if to answer your question, there are two V-switches. One is that's completely private to the node. It has no physical uplinks going out at all. And there's another V-switch that actually has a physical uplink going to it. And then you'll use the two V-switches to actually route this traffic out and back in. So when the controller fails, the link between them gets yes. enabled. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm yeah. just I'm a little confused on how they're able to communicate, even though it is a private V switch that you're talking about, and you have another V switch sitting out there that's actually doing client traffic. Or, or it, do, it doesn't have a client traffic. I'm sorry, agent traffic, right? So how how are those two communicating? Because those are standalone, and they're not able to. Attack no. So the the private V switch has no uplink to it. That's all. That doesn't mean that it cannot connect to another vSwitch, uh, which is sitting in the same node. Right. That's the only difference. So the, the other vSwitch has a physical uplink to it. So it's kind of uh, the one that can communicate to the outside world and so on. This other one, this private one, only talks between ESX and the local controller. That's and its when job. when the local controller fails, then a dynamic link is created yes. between so, the two vSwitches to provide yep. a path for traffic to another controller. There yep. is a so, VMware best practices document that talks about the configuration <laughs> of these switches. So I want to kind of uh, delegate to that, but the, the, the literature is out there on how to kind of configure these kind of multiple switches and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I understand how they work. It's just that when you have a standalone switch like that and you're trying to communicate between the two, you have to have some type of transport between the two, and that's what I'm. That's yeah, so there is uh, port groups that actually connect the two these switches together. Okay. At a higher level. Let's let's take this. Turn. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is manageability. So one thing nice about our platform is that it is highly manageable. And um, in this, it, what we are talking about here is a technique which we call distributed orchestration. So imagine that there is a central bulletin board in the cluster. And when I say central, please don't assume that this is not fault tolerant. This is also fault tolerant. Anytime this dies, it comes back up uh, somewhere else through elections. So you post your desired state. The admin posts the desired state of the cluster in this central bulletin board. All the other nodes figure out what they're supposed to do, what the desired state is supposed to be, by looking at this bulletin board. And they just independently work themselves and change their state, heal themselves to that desired state. Examples, let's say the admin wants to start the cluster. You put somewhere on the bulletin board, the cluster state is supposed to be started. All the other nodes will figure it out and start the cluster services on them. If you want to stop the cluster, same thing. Put on that bulletin board. You want to stop the cluster. It'll bring it down. 
one very interesting use case is rolling upgrades. If you want to upgrade your system, let's say you're, you're on version X and you want to go to version Y, just write to the bulletin board that you want to be on Y and how to get the piece of new software. All the nodes will figure it out and upgrade themselves. They can also post stuff on the bulletin board so they're not all upgrading at the same time, so they're not all down at the same time. How much control do I have over how quickly that happens? I'm sorry? How much control do I have over how quickly that happens? It happens I'm in minutes. I'm not a very trusting fellow, as you may have noticed. <laughs> I don't want all of my nodes to update. I want some of my nodes to update, and I want to wait a couple of days to make sure that they haven't blown up and had massive amounts of blue smoke come out of them before I allow the rest of that, them. That is a feature we don't have. When we say move it to that state, it's, it, it means everyone moves to that state. But what we can do in the future is we say, hey, guys, move that state, but only these four of you guys, not all of them. There. So we can do it. Can I mean, if you want to stage new software upgrades, you'll do it in a separate cluster, which is a staging server or a staging cluster or something. But I think what you bring about is an interesting point. A lot, about of, a lot of customers are going to have a cluster. You know, sure. To say, oh, you need a whole dev environment with another 16 nodes. Well, you know, I mean, so, you know, I, don't know, I understand how you'd like that because it's a nice size check, but yeah, because you know, I may not be able to afford that. And also because uh, it's hard to just have heterogeneous software pieces talking to each other and yes. communicating. It's a hard problem. I mean, but it looks like it's a good feature request for us to figure out how you can keep the cluster in like mixed mode, mixed and, mode yeah. and keep it running for like two hours or something, or two days or something like that. Yeah, because I mean, if you look at how uh, fiber channel administrators work, they've got SAN A and SAN B, and there's at least a week between when you update the firmware on the switches on SAN A got and it. when you update the switches firmware on the switches on SAN B, just got in it. case something wrong with the upper. Sure. It's, it's a good point. It's not like vendors have never issued a bad patch. No, no, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a very good point. We have done it too. So. <laughs> <laughs> and while someone is upgrading itself, notice that auto padding kicks in and make sure that the gas VMs on that uh, node stable. Uh, the next very interesting feature we have in terms of manageability is dynamic addition of nodes. We use Bonjour, the Apple's Bonjour protocol, zero com. Everyone knows that. So just for uh, a little bit of background, you have a device come onto the network. Everyone just figures out that that device is there. That's what we use to add nodes. So if new node is added to the network, the existing cluster will figure out that there is a new Nutanix node on the network. It will show a pop-up on the GUI. All the admin has to do is say, yes, I want to add this node to the network. When a new system has been configured, same thing. Everyone is new. Everyone kind of recognizes each other. These are all these new nodes. Everyone will show a pop-up. I recognize these other five Nutanix nodes. Do you want to form a cluster out of them? All the admin has to do is say yes. It just happens. So when I add a node to an existing cluster, it automatically balances? Yes. Once it's part of the system, MapDuce runs, figures out that here are some empty disks that start migrating data. So it automatically leaves that. So this stuff. With disks or disks and workloads? So it's storage and compute? Or? Well, so admin. Uh, the policies on the VMs are up to the admin. If he wants to automatically kind of move the VMs, that will happen. But if he doesn't want to, then they'll stay but in that, the that is the domain of VMware. We also don't want to touch the compute side of things. We learn from that, that by the way, VMware wants based on DRS to move these VMs to this new node. And then we learn and we'll adapt to it and move the data close to it. But we as uh, sitting kind of uh, as a storage service don't want to be in the path of DRS and other such things. So it lit literally takes minutes to add a node. Um, you know, we were joking today, so we like to say that we actually go into the customer uh, installations and get out in half an hour. And, and Steve and I were joking, what do we do for that half an hour? We can just do them in five minutes. And it's like the remaining 25 minutes is for coffee. So, so um, node removal is also through the GUI. You want to remove a node, you can just click. I don't want this node in the system anymore. The system will make sure that node doesn't have any leftover single replicas that need to be replicated, and then says, OK, you can take them off. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is um, the fact that we are hypervisor agnostic. Again, referring back to my architectural diagram, there is nothing in our architecture that relies on the fact that ESX is running on the system. So we can run with ESX, Hyper-V, KVM, Zen, anything that you like. But today, so for the last three years, we've been working with ESX. Now I'm also proud to announce support for KVM. We can also work with KVM. The advantages of KVM, well, it's free, so there's lower cost of ownership. 
and it's open source, so people can tinker with it, customize it the way they like. And it's suitable in environments where all the VMware ecosystem is not needed. Uh, you know, uh, kind of if you want to run big data computations and stuff, you don't want to mean vMotion, all that fancy, fancy tools. You don't want to pay VMware licensing fees. You can use KVM, and you can run Hadoop on the system, which kind of legs into the next thing that I want to talk about, which is support for Hadoop in our system. But any questions on this? Why KVM, not Hyper-V? Yes. I that was we, we, right. So Hyper-V, we're looking at Hyper-V. We evaluated Hyper-V about three months back. It was highly unstable. It was a business decision to go with KVM. Also, it gels well with Hadoop. That's why we went KVM. But <laughs> Windows Server 2012. It was very instable. It was a better version. Before, this was like June, July. It was horrible. I think it would crash and burn. And yeah, we, we couldn't keep it up very long. Uh, and we didn't want to. We, we didn't want to. I think the bad thing I've heard about Hadoop 2012. Well, again, this was three months ago. Please, the difficult part is to support SMB. What? Or SIFS. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 actually, let, let, me be, let me be perfectly clear. Hyper-V does not support SIFS. SMB 2.0. SMB 3.0. SMB 3.0. Yeah. Uh, but we guys, uh, you guys do add SMB 3.0 support later on? We, so we were hoping, we'll, we're kind of watching to see if, uh, you know, Microsoft wants to add NFS support. But yeah, we will add, if Microsoft wants to add NFS support or not, because Windows Server 2012 has NFS, Hyper-V does not. Hyper-V doesn't have support for it. No, Windows Server 2012 itself does. Yes. Yeah, but the problem is it's not good enough. The hy hypervisor path has to have an NFS client that can talk right. to an NFS storage. Exactly. So Which they have the code, they just have to put it in Hyper-V, and we're waiting to see if they do that, or, or we have to do SMB. <laughs> Yeah, you have to do SMB. Just call them and ask them to do it. They'll do it. Um, also, it was, I mean, KVM, another reason, obviously, is it was expedient since it supports even work for us. So we, we can make iSCSI and Hyper-V work, except that it's, again, going back to the dark ages of yeah, log based we, management. We, we, we've already yeah. talked. We've, right. we've, we're, it's we're all agreed we yeah. much prefer right. yeah. the yeah. features that working out of files. Yeah, it was, it, it was a business decision for multiple reasons. Stability. But the fact that KVM already had NFS, the fact that KVM works well with the two, people want it free, so on so forth. But soon. Um, so, uh, you know, that legs into my next discussion. Uh, you know, we actually talked about Hadoop in VMworld. Uh, so we are, we, we are building a platform that is qualified for running multiple workloads. We've done well in multiple markets, VDI market, test and dev. We are also venturing out in the big data market. So we have qualified our platform for running Hadoop. And um, our platform actually can afford pretty high sequential high performance, and that's why Hadoop workloads are doing so well, because they are primarily um, doing sequential I.O. The virtues of running Hadoop in a virtualized environment are, um, you know, you can have one environment to run multiple workloads. It's not like if your Hadoop cluster is idle, you can't run anything else on that system. It's a virtualized environment, so you can run other workloads while you're not running Hadoop. Another advantage is, you know, the data, you can share data between your Hadoop jobs and your regular jobs. So you don't have to kind of move data from one cluster to another. It all sits in, NF, in NDFS. That's another advantage. And obviously, improve utilization, like you said. So this may be coming up on a later slide, but which, uh, which way you do for you working with uh, Cloudera, <laughs> Apache, Pure, MapR, Hortonworks? Yeah, I think, I believe we do MapR, uh, Cloudera also. Not MapR. Actually, MapR is uh, sort of if you look at it, we obviate MapR, because they talk about snapshots, and we can do 50 other things beyond snapshots. Mm -hmm. Because their whole claim to fame is we can make Hadoop Enterprise great with snapshots. We're like, well, there's snapshot, there's clones, there's backup, there's DR, there's 50 other things that we already do, which it comes out of the box that you don't need a MapR. Yeah. So internally, we have, we are successful with MapR, but I don't know if you're, if you're on a production, that's what we did to say. So production, cloud error. you got? Uh, cloud error. Okay. Cloud error, yeah. Are you planning to work with Hortonworks? Uh, we probably are. CDS is actually, I mean, uh, yeah, sorry, HTTP uh, is something that uh, you might have already downloaded. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just want to uh, throw a slide out there on our Hadoop performance. So again, we have, you know, the one of the key benchmarks in the Hadoop world is Terrasort. And people showcase the performance of their platform by running Terrasort on that. Now, the world record 
you know, is basically you know, how many minutes you take to run Terrasort, and people have thousands of machines at this system. What we've done here is we've taken our um, 2U appliance, actually, um, you know, two blocks, so, so two, eight nodes in total, and we ran Terrasort on that. And we're doing a comparison here on a megabytes per second basis when you run Terrasort. So this is not a minutes, this is not a time comparison. It's how much you can deliver in terms of bandwidth. And if you see us, we can do something like 250 megabytes per second on one to you. And the record, the record is held by a bunch of HP machines when they talk about one and a half minutes. And they, at that rate, do about 110 megabytes per second. So again, I'm not claiming that we are breaking a world record here. But on a per node basis, we are doing very well. And we will talk about, uh, you know, Howard is going to talk about uh, an effort that we put to actually uh, run Hadoop on multiple nodes, lots of nodes. I, I, I don't want to see this thunder. So uh, the takeaway from this slide is actually we can deliver very high sequential performance per, per block. So the world record that MapR came up with on Google App Engine like a month ago was doing 10 to 15 megabytes a second per node. We're doing 60 megabytes a second per node actually right now. So if you were to put together 300 of our nodes, which I think again, it's 15 with 100 from how But just keep that in perspective. It's 10 to 15 megabytes a second for map our world record to what we could do at 60, 65 megabytes a second in our case. OK. And I'm guessing that if you're doing Hadoop on this, you don't want to use it for other workloads because you're eating up a fair amount of CPU, and that's going to take away from your SSD performance. Well, VMware will tell you it's mixed workloads, so right? That, that's, that brings me to my next slide. Uh, support for heterogeneous nodes. <coughs> so you can have, uh, in the first bullet, is, uh, you can grow, compute, and storage independently. And like we discussed, we encourage you to buy storage-heavy nodes. In fact, we have a bunch of demo systems here that you can tinker with after this, uh, this talk is over. Wait, did you say you have a bunch of demo systems we can take home? Carry <laughs> 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 it. You kind of tell it. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> okay. The so three of us will work on a timeshare thing. Sure, we can carry no, this. no problem. He didn't finish his sentence, so he carried it with one hand. Yeah, right. <laughs> no problem. Okay. I've been working out. <laughs> so in this forum, I, I also want to announce that we are the first ones to run in one cluster, multiple hypervisors. We believe we are the first ones. And I don't need and, the UPS. And, and that answers your question. You can actually have a KVM cluster and a ESX cluster. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, a bunch of uh, nodes running ESX, a bunch of nodes running KVM, all in one cluster all together running NDFS. You can run your Hadoop workloads on one part of the system, your VDI workloads on another part of the system, and they will coexist. Okay. And the nice thing, the advantage is you can share the data between the two, because it's all sitting on NDFS. So uh, again, we had put up a, a demo system, but I don't think we kind of brought it here. No, or, it's here. It's no, 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 that, the running KVM and, oh, uh, and ESX yeah. together. That, that we kind of didn't bring it here. You could show us how quickly it is to set this one up on like that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Minutes, coffee, coffee, and then minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, obviously, we have the ability to do a cold migrate between the different hypervisors. So you can take a VM on ESX, move it, uh, shut it down, move it to uh, the KVM side, and the data doesn't doesn't change. So you've got the B2B conversion. I'm sorry. You get the, the format converter. The format converter. The V2B virtual to virtual. So I think it's a cold form. So what what's the cold uh, conversion looking like? Oh, it's uh, well, basically they're just OBS. So you can import it as well. Yeah, it's the, yeah, exactly. So it, it, it converts on the fly to an OVF and puts it back in. So what's the time difference on that? Uh, I would need to get some more data. We, we can reach back out to you. It's not supposed to be real time. I mean, today right. we're just playing with it. Because by the way, what this keeps us open to, as you realize, is that tomorrow we have to cloud burst to AWS. We can do those things as well. Now, it doesn't have to happen in real time. But you know, if it takes a day for you to spill away a data center from your on-premise Nutanix to an off-premise uh, Nutanix running in AWS, all those things are possible. OK, moving on to my next slide. This is uh, my last slide. So serviceability, uh, we are announcing much better support for serviceability. We are uh, going to add support for hot swappable disks. Earlier, our system was hot swappable, but if you <coughs> want to do hot swap a drive, you'll have to shut down a node. The limitation doesn't come from us. The limitation comes from ESX. I'll tell you why. The limitation is, uh, you know, so ESX is virtualizing all the devices and presenting them to the controller VM. Well, when it does that, it virtualizes the disk controller. And if you were to take away any disk from the disk controller, ESX doesn't like it. It enters into this dreaded state called APD or call pass down. 
and that was the limitation. The, the difference here, what we've done is, we now pass through the whole disk controller to the controller VM. So ESX doesn't even see it. And by that, now we can hot swap stuff. So you might, you might, you might question, how, well, how, how does ESX run that? Well, we boot ESX off of a USB drive, which is primarily just read-only. And we build an in-memory file system for ESX to kind of write on and ship data from that to our controller VM. So there are a bunch of stuff going on with covers. So that basically means that now you can just take off stuff, take back stuff, and you don't have to reboot the node. ESX doesn't die. So well, this, is a, this is a very important slide. The reason is because most other quote-unquote hyper-converged or virtual controller appliances that you might have heard of, they're all running on top of VMFS. All of them are running on top of VMFS. And there's circular dependencies that actually make them go uh, many times find VMware bugs when you have I.O. coming from uh, VMware and then going back to VMware again. There's lots of cyclic dependencies that have thrown out bugs. And then there are other problems like hot swap that you just can't do with those quote-unquote virtual controllers. So even virtual controllers are not apples to apples. There's like various variations. And what we have shown here is that to make something enterprise grade, you need to have this ability to pass through the entire hardware from ESX and not even make it look like it's, it belongs to VMware or it's managed or coordinated by VMware. Right. Uh, I'll take questions here um, and then pass it on to Howard. Uh, any questions on stuff that I've covered? This is my last slide. So just to recap on that, you're, you're using that controller VM as an abstraction layer to the, to the, uh, to the, to the hardware. Yes, now we used to share the SATA controller with VMware because VMware used to boot off of one of the drives. And I said, screw that. VMware can boot off another place, which is a USB drive. <laughs> and then we take control of the entire SATA controller and we pass through it to us. And now mm -hmm. all the hardware is managed by us. And there's no such thing as crappy physical RDM this and all that stuff that, uh, in fact, we used to at least go down the path of physical RDM. Every other controller that's running virtual in VMware is using VMFS. They cheat all the time. And they're using VMware as a file system to do all that stuff. You know, which basically is meaningless. You know, it doesn't mean anything if you're using VMFS underneath. Oh, OK, so I'll pass it on to Howard, who's going to talk about the next great thing we're doing. So um, actually, before I talk about this project that we haven't announced yet, but wanted to give you guys a preview about uh, what something we're calling Project Infinity, I want to just kind of sum up what you've heard from the other presenters. I think the real proof in what we've built is the business results, the business momentum. You know, by our estimation, we're the fastest growing enterprise infrastructure company in Silicon Valley. And the proof of that is we've been selling for four quarters. And in our fourth quarter, our, we're currently on a run rate to displace about $100 million of legacy equipment annually. So that's about as fast as I've heard of any company growing. Now, that's not a $100 million run rate for us. We're, you know, we're a small private company, so we're not disclosing that information. But when we calculate how much legacy equipment are our customers displacing, right? we're on a $100 million run rate right now. And so that's a pretty significant achievement after only being in the market for four quarters. So um, with that, we're going to talk real quick about um, a project that we're going to announce shortly, something we call Project Infinity. Uh, and then we're going to do a demo after that and show you guys the product. So Project Infinity is our proof that the system scales infinitely. Um, we designed the system to scale infinitely, and we really believe that it will. So we've picked a, a random arbitrary number. We're going to create a continuously running cluster of 200 nodes and have it operationally active the whole time. And we're going to start small, and we're going to build up this cluster over time. We're going to be very public with the uh, status and the progress of that. So we're going to be able to share status updates with all of you and also publicly uh, through our website as far as how we're, uh, how we're doing. And uh, we believe we're going to break a number of records, including the number of VMs that you could run on a single data store, the number of VMs that you could run in a 100U uh, footprint. Um, and we want to break other records as well. Um, if there's a record that you want to challenge us with, we'd love to hear it. Um, we believe that we're going to break almost all of the records for data stores uh, in, 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 this, in, this, uh, in this project that we call Infinity. I think there are people who have a much higher value of Infinity. Have a <laughs> higher value for the brand? Hmm? What's that? For the brand? No, for the definition of the word Infinity. infinity. For, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why they're not yeah. He's saying that it's not true. Yeah. Yeah. 200 is a proof point. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just the key, a proof. The key that uh, Howard brings 
You start at 10, you get a number. Start do 50, you get a number. You do yeah. 100, you get a number. You do 200, you get a number. And then you say, you know what? What just happened here? It's linearly scalable. Mm -hmm. So do you continue to show 400, 800, or do you have uh, that be an exercise left to the reader saying, well, you've seen exactly how this platform works and linearly scales, but there's no single point of bottleneck, there's no single point of failure. Mm -hmm. If you wanted a 400 node cluster, we can go and build it, give us the bottleneck. Okay. Yeah. So, so you can scale the storage backend to be uniformly distributed across? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. That's, that's, that's the goal of the project, show you that. And one thing that uh, we actually mentioned here this is this. I have to see. You have to see, right? <laughs> we will. We will talk. Yeah, and we'll the good it. thing is that it's going to be in the factory. Maybe that's one thing that you want to point out. How it is yeah, so we're going to actually run this from our uh, uh, the factory that manufactures our boxes. Um, so it's going to be running there. We're going to actually uh, provide an interface to allow you to monitor uh, what the statistics of the system are. Um, and we actually even have thought about exposing the, the management UI uh, to allow you to use the UI into the system and to play with it and run, run reports and things like that. So we're going to announce this shortly, um, but we wanted to give you guys a heads up about this um, so and talk about the goal. Yeah. I'm sorry? I said, so I have to fly to Taiwan. Like to no, no, the, 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 the factory's here. here. <laughs> the, the factory's in, uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, one yeah. aspect of the system is that uh, whatever we ship is actually going to be shipped from this system to customers. So you're right. constantly changing. You add new nodes to the system. You take well, off some you, other. You got to burn them in. Might as well make them do yeah. something. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. I think yeah. you nailed it. So from so one end you'll be adding this. nodes, adding blocks. From the other end you'll be plucking blocks. And it's going to be online all the time. So you know the whole notion of add nodes and remove nodes and everything else has to be working. 